Hey y'all, what's up? Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. My name is Jess, and today I'm gonna be talking to you guys about stuff you can get from the grocery store and then grow in your garden. It's gonna be a sit and chat video, so if you wanna grab a cup of coffee and a notebook, uh, we're gonna be here for a minute talking about this stuff. Definitely doing kind of a classroom style of teaching here. Now, there is an unfortunate misperception when it comes to this topic. And every time I mention it, I get a lot of people that even still argue, no, that's not right. But more than that, I get a lot of comments from people saying, oh yeah, I do that all the time. So I am asking you if you have experience growing things like this and like what I'm talking about today from the grocery store, please share your experience in the comments below. If you have something that you have experience with that I've missed and failed to mention in this video, please share your experience in the comments below. In these sorts of videos, the comment section ends up being just as valuable, if not more valuable than the video itself, because the collective wisdom of being able to hear from so many different people and their firsthand experiences, you just can't replace that. So first and foremost, let's cover what is true and what is not true, because it is very commonly stated that you just can't grow stuff from the grocery store, and that's really not true. Now, the main thing that I hear regarding potatoes and garlic and some of the different things that people go, wow, I see that thing sprouting on my counter. Could I put that in the ground? And people say, no, that's been sprayed with something that will, will basically retard the growth and keep it from growing properly. And I don't know actually if that is true ever, in what cases it is true. So when I plan on growing something that I get from the grocery store, I usually will purchase the organic option. I'll purchase organic potatoes, organic garlic, but I know many people who have told me, and I personally in some cases have tried it myself to take a regular non-organic potato that is growing eyes and put it in the ground and it's grown and produced potatoes. So can it be true in some cases? Maybe, I guess, uh, but it is definitely not true in all cases. But because of kind of all of the chemicals that are used in big agriculture and the possibility of something being wrong, if I am purchasing something from the store that I'm gonna try to grow, I do typically go for the organic option. Now, let's talk about the hybrid debate. Uh, another thing that you hear a lot when people say, oh, you can't save seeds out of that thing from the grocery store, it's a hybrid, it won't produce again. And that's, that's also kind of a generalization that's really just not true. Now, we talk about preparedness and like survival situations, and if it ever comes down to like a preparedness survival situation, you plant the seeds that you've got. And if all you've got is a tomato sitting on your counter that you bought at the grocery store, it's going to produce something. The misconception is, is whenever people say hybrids aren't sustainable, what that means is, is if you buy a nice medium-sized red tomato from the grocery store, it's probably going to taste like disappointment, but if that's what you've got, and you were to scoop the seeds out of that, it's, it's going to have tomato seeds in it, and those tomato seeds are only going to grow a tomato plant. But the thing is that hybrid might have been developed for those certain qualities that exist, and those seeds won't be stabilized. So you might get a different shape of tomato. If you save all those seeds, you might get multiple different shapes of tomatoes, different colors, different sizes. They might not taste super good. They might not be super producers, so you might not get tons of tomatoes. So when possible, if you're going to devote your garden space to growing a tomato, you probably want to err on something like open pollinated seeds of either an heirloom variety or a newer hybrid variety. If they're stabilized, they're called open pollinated, which means you can save the seeds from it and get a plant that produces a fruit like that parent fruit. But it does not mean that you cannot grow from hybrid seeds, which kind of segues into the first topic I wanna to talk about, which is saving seeds out of fresh produce from the grocery store. Um, my Aunt Martha, who has since passed away, is my cousin Amy's mom. She was such a chronic seed saver that she would pull the seeds out of a pepper on a salad at a restaurant, put it in a napkin, and go home and grow it. She would pull seeds out of anything. Grocery store produce, 
food at a restaurant didn't matter what it was deadheading stuff on the way into buildings my mom does that my mom will see deadheaded flowers that she, you know maybe they've already been chopped down or they're going to be chopped down and just cleared out she'll grab one of the heads off because it's full of seeds you can save seeds all over the place and people grow food from the seeds in grocery store produce all the time the hybrid stuff the non-organic stuff it will grow if the seed is mature so consider this a watermelon that you buy at the store it has a hard skin obviously it's got fully matured seeds in it same thing with a tomato it has fully matured seeds in it um, a cantaloupe um, peppers these things all have fully matured seeds however we have things like a cucumber that doesn't necessarily have summer squash those fruits are actually not fully mature you pick cucumbers young so they're nice and tender you pick your summer squash young so they're nice and tender so whenever you open those up those those seeds are real soft they're not hard yet those aren't gonna grow for you so you cannot save the seeds out of those but if the seed is mature you can save it and grow it again it might not be the best option for your garden to grow those seeds because if you only have space for 10 tomato plants how many do you want to risk on an unknown quantity because you cannot be sure on a hybrid seed that your fruit is gonna look anything like the fruit you saved it out of but if you were limited in being able to access seeds or if you did not have the money to buy seeds, then it is definitely an option and you can save those. And if you've got extra space and you're just wanting an experiment, you're wanting to play around with something, that's definitely a great one. If you are wanting to buy food and also get seeds, I suggest buying like heirloom tomatoes. Again, they very well might not look like the fruit you pulled them out of because of the potential for cross-pollination in those commercial growing spaces, but you're going to have kind of more of a chance of that, of, of getting something that's like the parent fruit. I do like to go with like saving from an organic option, but I have before eaten a pepper from the store that I thought, wow, this is really delicious. And a lot of times you have no idea what the variety is. It's not listed. And I've taken the seeds out of it and grown it and gotten something very similar to the fruit that I got it out of. So it's definitely a viable option. Now, one thing to consider is squash. So this is a little um, honey nut squash. Got this at just like a, or a grocery store, regular grocery store. There is this thing that gets repeated about how some hybridized squash, whenever you get cross-pollination in a squash, that they are poisonous and this is something that gets repeated a lot and so people say don't ever save seeds from squash that you can't be sure that they did not cross pollinate and when it comes to commercially grown squash very often they have cross pollinated squash just cross pollinates really easily now the thing is i actually don't know the field that this squash was grown in because i didn't get to talk to the farmer i bought it from the grocery store this could have been grown in a 20 acre field surrounded by squash just like this. The seeds in this could be for pure honey nut squash, but it could be grown in a really small section next to another type of squash that it crossed with and I might end up with something really weird. Uh, the concern about growing a squash that is poisonous it, if the, the squash that are poisonous, let me just put it this way. The squash that are poisonous, they're very bitter. It's obvious that there's something wrong with them. I did save seeds from a honey nut squash one year before these seeds were really easy to get. Um, I saved some from a squash from Trader Joe's and I planted it and I ended up with anything but honey nut squash. They were long, they looked more like butternut, they were definitely a hybrid, but they were edible. They weren't bitter, their flesh was good, and it still produced food even if it wasn't the sustainable food I wanted. So now when I want to grow honey nut squash, I'll buy the seeds from somebody who's selling those seeds or save them from my own honey nut squash where I know that I can isolate the blossoms and keep them from cross-pollinating. Cross but if I want an experiment, I might could scoop some out of this. I do not worry about toxic squash because I am aware that if it actually is a poisonous hybrid, which from what I understand is very, very rare, uh, it's gonna be really obvious. I'm not gonna accidentally kill my family by feeding them toxic squash, which is obviously the concern. I might waste the space in my garden, which if you have a large garden is less of a concern. But if you have a smaller garden, you might want to just stick with pure seeds when it comes to squash. I I've had pumpkins grow in my compost from the seeds I scooped out of the pie pumpkins I'd bought from the store for Thanksgiving 
pumpkin pie and then we had just an abundance of pie pumpkins in like July the next year because they just volunteered in the compost pile um, and I have grown melons accidentally from you know you spit the melons out of a watermelon uh, in the summer and we've had melons grow from those um, even the following year and those were bought at like roadside stands so don't dismiss seeds just because you bought the fruit from someone uh, do have your expectations in a place that it might be somewhat experimental but if you ever get to a place that you really need seeds for a garden that is a very viable option so in the nature of continuing with seeds let's talk about another place in the grocery store that there are a lot of seeds that you might not have considered so I've got a couple of things right here I have a little bottle of fennel seed which is just used in cooking, as well as poppy seeds, which obviously used in cooking. But this is the seed form of fennel. These are whole seeds and these will grow. And if you want to grow fennel with this, you've got a whole lot. If you were to buy a seed packet, of fennel uh, you would probably get about a fourth of this package for the exact same price now the issue is you don't know what variety this is you don't know exactly how it's going to bulb out and you don't get any growing instructions but it is definitely a way to get seeds economically the same thing for this poppy now, these are poppy flowers these are just the seeds of poppy flowers and I believe that most of the poppy seeds that you purchase for culinary use are from a variety that's often called bread flower poppy. Um, but it's just a really basic poppy. And the cool thing is, is if you grow these, you can let them produce their seed head and dry out and harvest more poppy seeds for culinary use out of them. Um, and also if you just wanted to seed a large space with poppies, like a, you know, a field or a roadside or somewhere that you're wanting to grow some poppies, this is a lot of seed for like three or four dollars. Other things that you can grow from the spice aisle, um, dill seeds. You can buy dill seed in these jars and that will grow into dill. Uh, coriander which is the seed version of cilantro so when it's in the herb version it's called cilantro when it bolts and produces seeds those seeds are called coriander um, that will grow just like the seeds that you might dig out of a fruit from the store you really don't know the variety you don't know the specifics about it but in a case like this where you might want to just try something or you might need a lot of something now other things that we purchase in seed form for culinary use are popcorn and beans. You might have been surprised when you first started gardening and you purchased your first seed package of beans and you opened it and thought, well, this looks just like dry beans. It's because it is. Um, so right here, I've got a couple of bags of dried beans. These are actually like a runner bean, scarlet runner bean here that I have a pound of. And right here, these are cranberry beans that I have a pound of. I purchased these from a place called Rancho Gordo. They make like heirloom varieties of beans and they sell them for culinary purposes. But there's no reason why you cannot put these in the ground and grow them and produce the exact same plant uh, with the exact same result as this. In most cases, beans do not readily cross pollinate. They can cross pollinate. I've had it happen in my garden, but in most cases, even planted right next to each other, they don't. Uh, so in most cases, when you plant beans from dry beans from the store, they're gonna grow more beans of their same kind. I have grown Scarlet Runner beans from a package like this before, and they produce Scarlet Runner beans. Now, if you're going to buy dry beans from the store, um, just regular old conventionally grown beans, I've used those before, um, kind of like as a cover crop. We had an area where we had dug in our front yard and we were having some, basically it was washing away some erosion issues. And my friend Jake was like, well, hey, do you got any bags of dried beans? And I did, of course, you know, $1 bags of just basic conventional dry beans. And we took those out and we just seeded them all along the area that we had dug because the roots dug in and they grew pretty quickly and that area from eroding. Now they weren't, we never let those go full size to bushes. We ended up mowing them down. Um, because the grass started to grow and we did not need them there to hold the soil in place anymore. 
but they sprout, they grow. You can use those for growing bean sprouts. You can use those uh, for sprouting for animal fodder and you can grow them in your garden. Now, when it comes to buying beans from the store, um, I've heard people say, air to the organic side for growing them. I don't really know that it makes a difference. These are not organic, however they are heirloom and I have grown from these. But again, I think it comes down to doing the experiment, being willing to take a chance, and also if you needed to seed a large area with a food crop, but you didn't have the finances to input a large amount of money buying all organic seed, buying an organic bag of beans from the store gives you way more um, of those seeds for a much lower price than buying that measure of seed from a seed company. Now let's talk about popcorn. This is also from the same company I got those from. Um, it's called Crimson Popping Corn and it is an heirloom variety of popcorn. So in the United States where I live, most of the corn you purchase from the store, if it is not labeled GMO free or organic, because organic, if, it, if it's labeled organic, it's, it's not supposed to be GMO. And, but most of the corn that you get at the store, if it's not labeled with those things, it is GMO. So if you're buying it in cereal, um, if it's like an additive in frozen meat, if it's breaded in anything corn, if it's got any sort of corn byproduct like corn syrups and stuff like that, um, if it's not labeled otherwise, it is probably a GMO crop. That is one of the main GMO crops in the United States with one exception and that is popcorn. So if you were to go buy just a regular bag of popcorn at the store, that is one crop that is not allowed to be grown and sold with GMO seed. The reason being is that GMO seeds are not legal to sell to the consumer. So when people are concerned about buying seed at the store and they're like, oh no, I got to get the non-GMO stuff, it's actually not legal to sell GMO seeds to the consumer. Farmers who buy GMO seeds, they have to sign contracts and all that stuff that they're not going to save the seeds, they're not going to sell the seeds. And while there may be some concern for cross-pollination and stuff like that, you're not going to go buy GMO seeds. And since popcorn is sold to the consumer in seed form, popcorn is not a crop that is legal to grow from a GMO seed. So when you buy a bag of popcorn at the store, you can grow that and get a corn from it. Now, I would be slightly hesitant to just go buy that because I have no idea what that variety would be. Corn is an intensive crop. It takes a lot of space. Um, it takes a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So if I plant corn on my farm, I want to have a pretty solid guarantee that I'm getting something worth growing. Whereas, you know, I might kind of experiment a little bit with a small space in my garden for an unknown pepper, or unknown tomato, or maybe experimenting with a squash. I'm not going to plant a field of corn with a bag of popcorn seeds that I don't know the variety and I don't know anything about. But if I'm able to buy something like this, which is a bag of heirloom popcorn, this I have grown from before and this I will grow from. That's actually why I got this because I'm gonna do a small section from this and just see what happens and see how close to this parent that it actually is. But these being heirloom seeds, I feel way better about growing these. Now that was kind of the list that I had just looking around my kitchen and thinking about it of things in seed form that I have experimented with in growing from the store or talk to people who have experimented with growing from the store. But if you have another experience of things that you have saved seeds from the grocery store and grown, please put them in the comments below because I think that could be really helpful to people. Next, let's talk about things that we grow from like cuttings or sprouting or different things like that. So I've got a few things right here in front of me. The first of which, ginger. So this is just some regular ginger that I got out of the produce section at the grocery store. I bought this a few months ago and when it started to sprout, I should have stuck it in some soil then but I wanted to make this video and that's why I didn't. And uh, now that I have made this video, I am gonna put this in some pots and grow it, it probably just right here in my house and maybe next to a window until it warms up enough or I have my greenhouse that I can put it out in. But you can see here that this ordinary knob of ginger from the grocery store has started sprouting off um, in multiple places. Same with this one. And this represents a lot 
of future ginger. So to grow ginger from the grocery store, um, all you have to do is buy some knobs like this, um, keep them in a warm place like your kitchen until they start to sprout off little bits. Uh, you could, at that point, you can cut them into pieces, letting at least one sprouting knob be on each piece, and they'll heal over just like this bit here has healed over and they kind of grow like a hard skin. And then you plant them in soil. You want to keep them pretty warm and transplant them out uh, once the danger of frost has passed. Mature ginger can actually survive a light frost, especially with a little bit of cover, but when it's young like this, you don't want to shock it by putting it out in cold weather. And this will grow and you can harvest a lot of ginger off a few bucks worth of ginger that you get at the store. If you buy ginger from a seed company, you might be able to get more information about the variety or it might come with some growing instructions. Uh, but it, essentially it's not different than the ginger you're getting from the store. I've talked to many people who have grown ginger from store-bought ginger. I'm doing it as well. And if you have never grown fresh ginger, man, it is a game changer. It's so, so good and it's very simple to grow. Next, garlic. Every year, whenever um, the topic of garlic potatoes come up, everybody says, well, why not from the grocery store? Now I've been told again, that garlic has some sort of inhibitor that keeps it from growing past a certain point. I have heard that from a lot of people who have never tried to grow it. I have talked to many people who have grown garlic from store-bought garlic. I have grown garlic from store-bought garlic and it has always grown and produced bulbs. Again, you do have the benefit when you're purchasing seed garlic to know exactly the variety and exactly what to expect from it, but I mean, we've all had garlic sprout on our counter. Much of it will grow. If you are unsure about it, because the garlic industry is kind of weird. A lot of garlic comes from China. Um, a lot of it is grown in really unethical situations. There's a lot of child labor involved in garlic. So when I buy garlic, I do like to make sure that it is grown in the United States. Um, so hopefully the people who grew it, grew it were um, handled in better situations. But there's really not a reason why you can't grow store-bought garlic. So when you're purchasing garlic, like if you were to go buy seed garlic, you would see that there are two varieties that are listed, either soft neck or hard neck. Now, soft neck garlic is what you have to grow if you want to braid them. If you've ever seen those lovely garlic braids that you can do after you dry it, you braid them together to hang them up in the pantry. Um, hard neck garlic is the one that produces the scapes. So whenever spring comes, right before they're mature, they send up a center stalk and you can cut it off and they're really delicious for culinary use. So with soft neck, you don't get a scape, but you do get longer storage and the ability to braid them. With hard neck, you do get the scape, but they don't, you don't braid them and uh, they typically don't store as long as a soft neck variety. Because a grocery store is wanting storage time, they're wanting more time to be able to sell something, most varieties, if not, I, I would venture to say all, but I'm sure there's an exception, but the majority of the varieties that you're gonna purchase at a grocery store are gonna be soft neck varieties. So you might wanna keep that in mind if you're trying to get garlic scapes, you might wanna buy some hard neck seed garlic, but if you're just trying to grow garlic to have it, you can do it from the grocery store. Um, I've even been in grocery stores before where I've seen like the purple garlic and uh, typically more specialty stores, when I am getting something to grow in my garden, I'll typically go to those more specialty stores, maybe spend a little bit more money on getting something that I'm like, oh, okay, that might be interesting to have in the garden. Which brings me to the topic of potato. So this is a sweet potato. And this, I have not done any effort at all to make this grow. Um, I, I noticed that it started sprouting and I set it aside for this video. But it has already started to produce little offshoots here. So you can see here, there's another one coming out of the top. So if you want to force sweet potatoes to do this, put some sticks in them and suspend them on a jar of water so the very bottom of them is in water. You might have done that experiment when you were a child in school or your children might have done it, where they take off and they will actually start to grow sprouts like this. They'll start to grow leaves. And all you have to do when it comes time to plant them is come and uh, either break, if you've got a nice long sprout that has some leaves on it, you just kind of break it off right at the potato and you go stick that in the ground and that's a sweet potato slip. So if you were to go to a store in the spring and purchase sweet potato slips, you would pay, 
I have no idea. It's going to vary all over the place, you know, 15 or $20 for 20 sweet potato slips. Whereas you could stick some potatoes in water and get them yourself. I have done this. I'd gone to Whole Foods once and bought this really awesome deep purple sweet potato. And I was like, this is so good. I want to grow this again. It started sprouting. So I stuck it in some water and grew them in my garden and they were great. They produced sweet potatoes just like the one I saved it from. And instead of paying 30 something dollars for those specialty slips, I paid, you know, like $2 for the sweet potato. And I was, I thought the sweet potato itself was kind of expensive. <laughs> I was like, that's a little high for a sweet potato, but for sweet potato slips, that's an actual excellent deal. <laughs> Now, I actually don't have any regular sprouting potatoes. I had some set aside. I think Maya must have either cut the eyes out and cooked them or I don't know. But um, a regular potato, everybody has had potatoes start growing eyes in their kitchen. They sprout little bits and, uh, and start to grow. And all you have to do to grow those in your garden is cut them and it, if, have a piece so like when you want a chunk of potato with at least one eye on it you can also put them in whole and just grow the whole potato with all the eyes if you put a whole potato in that is sprouting multiple places um it is going to grow multiple plants in close proximity which means you're going to get smaller potatoes um, I don't mind that because I really love like new potatoes, but if you cut them into chunks and let them grow a skin, you, you lay them out in a single layer, like on a sheet in your garage or somewhere where they can sit for a few days, maybe put a fan on them. They're going to grow, they're going to thicken up and grow skin just like that ginger did. And you plant one chunk every 10 inches. And that's how you get bigger potatoes because you have one plant not competing with other plants in the proximity. So you grow, you get fewer potatoes, but they're larger and you can, completely grow store-bought potatoes that way. Um, there is often a concern voiced that potatoes are kind of like sponges and so they suck up a lot of toxins out of soil. Um, and so when I have grown from store-bought potatoes, again, I've erred towards organics and the organic label is not a guarantee that it is perfect, but you know, hopefully those were grown in places where they weren't sprayed with a lot of stuff. But also I have known many people who have grown lots of potatoes from um, conventionally grown food potatoes that they bought at the grocery store and they sprouted. So they just threw them outside in the soil. And that might not be that much different from going to a feed store and buying whatever cheap seed potato they have. Those aren't organic either. So, you know, you, you might be dealing with the same thing. When you buy a seed potato, it has usually just been stored in a way to allow it to sprout more. Uh, so if you're wanting to plant potatoes out in April or May and use store-bought potatoes, you might look at buying them now, like in January, to give them time to sprout. Um, lay them out in a single layer in a place that they're not going to get moldy, so somewhere dry, uh, somewhere cool, put them in your garage. Uh, a dairy crate, if you're able to get like a dairy crate with the holes open in it, that's a good thing to put potatoes in to allow them to sprout and obviously somewhere where they're not going to attract rodents into your house. But with the sweet potatoes and the regular potatoes, just a little bit of foresight and you can get a lot of seed stuff from your store. Now, let's talk about propagation. So right here I have a basil plant. This was $2.98 at the grocery store. Um, I didn't have any basil. And so I bought these plants because we were making pizza at home and I really wanted some fresh basil. And we picked some of the leaves off of them. But with basil, basil is about one of the easiest herbs to propagate and many herbs actually are very simple to propagate. Um, rosemary is pretty easy to propagate. Thyme and oregano, you can propagate all of these. But basil I think is probably the one that does propagate the easiest and the fastest. So all you do is clip off or break off one of these little sprigs of this basil plant and stick it in some water. And within about a week to a week and a half, you could add rooting hormones if you wanted to make it faster, but it's really not necessary. Um, this will start growing roots and then you can stick it into some soil and you will have another plant. Now, if you buy these store-bought plants that were in the produce section, 
do not go plant these immediately outside. These have never seen the light of day. They have only ever been grown under artificial light and kept indoors. Uh, they will shrivel and die so fast and it has nothing to do with your gardening skills. These plants just are not hardened off. If you wanna buy one of these plants from the store, and plant it outside. So you know, go sit it outside for an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening and do that and then lengthen the time and make sure that you're putting it outside after all danger of frost has passed because basil is really frost tender. But if you don't wanna spend $4 for one plant to plant out in your garden in the spring, here in the winter, if you've got a good windowsill, you can buy one of these plants in the produce section and turn this into, gosh, probably 10 or 12 plants in jars of water, put them in starter cups with soil, and by the time it's time to move them out, you've got a garden full of basil for $3. Plenty uh, in the meantime for your pizza. So that's all the things I have here on my table to share with you today. Oh, hi, William. But if you have anything to add to this if you've ever had any experience saving seeds from food in a restaurant or from a grocery store or growing clippings or cuttings from anything please uh, share that experience and maybe the process some instruction for people in the comment section more than anything i just wanted to get y'all's wheels turning in your mind and kind of challenge the misconception that you have to go the route that is laid easiest for you to grow a garden. You don't have to necessarily go buy seeds from a seed store. Now there are benefits of that, like I said, understanding the varieties, getting, uh, being sure that that seed is really fresh, um, maybe having a more, more guaranteed experience of what you're gonna get from it. But I do think that this is important to know that you have all of these food options at your fingertips, a lot of times for significantly less cost. And it's just nice to know for a place of preparedness what you're actually able to do. So that's what I, this video is about. I just wanted to start that conversation, uh, kind of get the wheels turning in your mind. And I hope that this adds uh, some options to your garden this year, or at least some interest. <laughs> Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.